Now let us turn to the first book of Samuel and chapter 17, reading from verse 57. 1 Samuel 17 from verse 57 and into chapter 18. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that is Goliath, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. <clears throat> then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the, the slaughter of the Philistines that the women came out of all cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. Because of Saul's rebellion and disobedience, God rejected him from being king over Israel. And not only that, but it would be the end of his dynasty there would be no longer a king in his family. It was the ultimate loss and disaster. When Samuel told Saul this, he also hinted that a better man would replace him. In chapter 15 and verse 28, And Samuel said unto him, the Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Who would this man be? Well, whoever it was, he was not going to be popular with Saul. It was, of course, David. And what set David on his path to the throne was what happened in chapter 18 and from verses 5 to 9 here in 1 Samuel, and especially verse 8. Saul was very wroth and displeased. They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And this was the beginning of David's troubles 
from Saul. But it was also the beginning of his eventually becoming king. And it reminds us, dear friends, that the comfort in our troubles is where they lead in God's purposes. We should not so much look at troubles that happen in themselves, but rather see that God has a purpose in them and that they are leading to a good end. Leave God to order and provide. In every change he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. It was a rough and thorny path for David to the throne of Israel, but it was God's way of preparing him and training him so that he would be a far better king than Saul could ever be. And life's difficulties are God's appointed way of doing us nothing but good and making us more useful. In principle, David's antitype, the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom David was a type, it was like that for him too. The way to exaltation at the Father's right hand, giving him glory, was through the way of suffering and the way of the cross. In Hebrews 12 and verse 2, for the joy that was set before him, he uh, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of God. So the principle then, that even though things are hard, they lead to that which is much better than they would have been if things had been easy. But let us look at verses 5 to 9 in 1 Samuel 18 because there are important lessons for us here. They speak to us about being wise and not being wise. And let us then look at this and see, first of all, wisdom in verse 5. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. It's not easy to be wise. It's more than our knowing about things. Comparatively easy to know about things, to gain facts and information and knowledge but wisdom is the application of what you know so that our words are right and our actions are beneficial you'll notice here David behaved himself wisely true biblical wisdom is always practical and always bears fruit in terms of our uh, actions and our conduct, uh, the, the courses we take, the way we handle people, and all that kind of thing. And it's the opposite of making blunders and costly mistakes. Proverbs 28, verse 26, Whoso walketh wisely shall be delivered from the other possibility of getting things so badly wrong. You can see it illustrated in the case of Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 9, you have three words, understanding, judge, discern. And then in verse 12, wise. So these three go to making up being wise, right understanding, right judgments in things, discernment. Now what was it for David here? How is it that any of us 
is ever made wise or grows in wisdom. Well, here, for one thing, David had glorified God. You notice in verse 6, it came to pass as they came and when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine. In the margin, the slaughter of the Philistines. This was a latest campaign against the enemies of the Lord. But it's an echo, isn't it, of what we read in verse 57 of the previous chapter. David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Goliath, with his head. Goliath's head in his hand. And we know that before David was so mightily used to bring down that giant, uh, David said, verse 45 of 1 Samuel 17, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And so you see, all David's trust was in the Lord as he uh, swung that sling around and that stone left it and sank into the head of Goliath and brought him down to his death. David had God's glory in view and now he comes from another campaign against Philistine armies and it's the same thing, surely, giving glory to God that there has been this great victory. And dear friends, it tells us that the context in which any Christian is made wise is when there is a single eye to God's glory. And you've got it illustrated in Matthew 6, verse 22. The light of the body is the eye, and if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. In other words, a single eye to pleasing and honouring God. And that has an enlightening effect. And it grants to us uh, that ability to have the understanding, the judgment, the discernment that leads to wisdom. In other words, it clarifies things when we really want to glorify God. If we are seeking ourselves and promoting ourselves, that darkens things and will be stupid and unwise and do everything that's wrong. But there's an enlightening effect. We see as we should see when we keep God's glory in view. Illustrated again in Psalm 36, verse 9, that we sang earlier. In thy light shall we see light. Look to God and seek to honour and glorify him. And he will look to you and show you what is wisdom's way. And so David behaved himself wisely in giving God the glory, and that became his wisdom. Another thing is this, that David had the Lord's presence. Over a, a bit further into 1 Samuel 18, you find in verse 14, similar words, and David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. That's the explanation. The presence of God, who is the only wise God. And we think, don't we, about God in wisdom guiding our way and showing us his will in things. But you see, he can guide our thinking and he can guide our decisions as well. And he can teach us vital matters. And it's through his word that he does this. Colossians 3 verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And you see, left to ourselves, without the word, we shall 
have our thinking, our decision-making, and our behaviour self-centred, subjective, what it seems to me, what seems right in my eyes. But the wonderful thing about God's word is it governs our thinking and it shows us how we should have uh, the right outlook. And so God's word informs us to make us wise. Proverbs 2 verse 6, the Lord giveth wisdom. It's the word is uh, a lamp unto our feet and a, a light unto our way. If you're exercised about some decision that you must make or some course that you've got to follow or how to face a certain situation or handle a certain individual, the more you're in the Bible, the more God will condition you in your outlook and approach to things and you'll be given that sense of what's right and certainly when you meet the situation at the time it'll be very clear to you the Lord is with you to bring his word to bear upon you so that it'll show you these things the Lord's gracious presence using his word as our guide and then a further thing is this. He had God's blessing. Look at verse 5 where it says David behaved himself wisely or in the margin you could translate it prospered. Things went well for him. Uh, the trouble was they went so well that uh, it wasn't good news for Saul. But they did go well. Proverbs 3, verse 17, Wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. And the great comfort to David was that when the persecution from Saul really came to its height, he had the knowledge that he had done what is right, and that was his great comfort. The great Comfort of knowing that the Lord was with him. He had behaved himself wisely by God's grace. He had nothing to reproach himself with. The Lord was pleased with him. Pleasantness. Peace. And dear friends, a good conscience is a great comfort in troubled times. Someone has put it like this. Those who are reconciled to God and in communion with him are consciously living in a friendly universe. God is over all. God is with us. He's pleased. And even though many are displeased and circumstances are adverse and we might be suffering, Nonetheless, God is prospering. And we have the comfort of knowing that we're doing his will. We're in the right way. Everyone else is wrong. We're in the right way. Because we're being led in wisdom's ways. And no, ma no matter who might be unfriendly, we're living in a friendly universe because God himself is our friend. Well, that wisdom then that David displayed, and that can be ours as well. Let us see secondly, though, unwisdom. You've always got that. And here in verses 6 and 7, And it came to pass, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, the women came out, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets of joy and instruments of music. And as they played, they said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Choral dances to celebrate the return of the returning victorious army. Tambourines and stringed instruments. But look, 
what we might call an odious comparison. In verse 7, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And this displeased Saul very much. Now these women should not have said this. It was probably not even true since Saul had been a soldier much longer than David. But they were carried away with their admiration of David. But it teaches us, dear friends, we should never put someone on a pedestal because it's the beginning of all kinds of problems. Christians tend to do this, don't they? They look up admiringly at some individual and they make the comparison with themselves. Oh, I'm not gifted like him. Oh, I can't speak like he does. Oh, I'm not able to do what he does. And then there's this odious comparison and they feel bad and they feel inferior. Or maybe in marriage, a wife perhaps uh, complains to her husband in a very sweet way, but nonetheless gets the point home and says, oh, you're not like so-and-so's husband. He wouldn't have done that. Or you're not like so-and-so's husband. He does this. And that kind of thing is hurtful and discouraging and should never be done. Never make comparisons. It's not fair. And it certainly wasn't fair to David here or to Saul, really, as it turned out. For one thing, you see, David himself would not have wanted that comparison. If David has slain his ten thousands, if that was literally true, it was by the grace of God and the blessing of God upon his campaign. And David gave God the glory for that anyway. And we're all at different stages of spiritual progress. And we're all gifted in different ways. And we are capable of doing things perhaps which others can't do. But others can do things that we can't do. But we make allowance for the variation. Make allowance that there's still more grace to be had. And more progress to make. But my dear friend, for your own peace of mind, don't put anyone on a pedestal. And look up and uh, almost envy them or feel bad yourself. Because you see, an additional factor is this. The very one that you are so putting on a pedestal, you don't live with him or her. It's been said that no man is a hero to his valley. And what someone is like at home is what they're really like. And it then becomes not quite as it seems. And the bubble can be pricked. Now I'm not saying there's hypocrisy. And a Christian is one thing in church and a totally different thing at home. But I'm saying this. That home life is the real proof of grace. Or sometimes the lack of grace. And it could be that that person that you've put on that pedestal sometimes bemoans their own sinful failures in the domestic realm and has to repent and cry to God for more grace. But you don't see that. You only see what you see. And so don't put people on a pedestal. And don't make comparisons. Thank God for what you are and pray, God, that you'll have more grace to fully be what he wants you to be. And you see, the thing is here that the one who is unfavorably compared is put into temptation. In verse 8, Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him, and he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And then he realizes, what's next? He's going to have the kingdom. 
And you see, it's all these thoughts in his mind now and all the carnal stirrings up. As someone has put it, that there was this rankled and festering and incurable jealousy that rose up. And so these women, they should not have done this. Saul began to resent this paragon of virtue, this David that he was being compared with in the women's praises. And oh, what an f- unwise thing this was. What an unwise thing. In military terms, if they wanted to sing praises, well, give Saul and David equal due. But too late, you see. And little did those singing women realize what would become of their innocent but unwise words. Once you say something like this, you can't take it back. Once it's been said, the rankling, the carnal reaction begins. And it causes, I say, so much difficulty and temptation to the one unfavorably compared so the unwisdom and it shows doesn't it that to be wise would be to refrain from making such comparisons but Christians are not wise often are they in how they put things they speak of someone in comparison with another one preacher in comparison with another preacher One church in comparison to another church. And there can be then these beginnings of struggles with jealousy and uh, rivalry and that kind of thing. And here is something to be avoided. Let's look thirdly. Not only at the wisdom of David and the unwisdom in these women, but... Let's now look at the foolishness of Saul himself. Verses 8 and 9. Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And it made him brood over the words of the song. Now, how much better it would have been If he, hearing these words, 10,000 slain by David, thousands slain by me. But praise God, thousands of the enemies of the Lord slain. And that's all that mattered. And God had blessed the arms of these two leaders and the armies that had fought against the Philistines, how much better it would have been for Saul to have actually rejoiced, even if David had slain more, apparently. What does it matter? The fact is, the work has been done. What does it matter? Who has the credit? Who has most credit? These are the enemies of Israel. This is the work of the Lord. This is for his glory. That's the only thing that matters We should be together in this. Now, who is Saul really serving in this? He's not serving the Lord. He's serving himself. That's the great problem for him. In Romans 12 and verse 15, it says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Now, you see, we're found out just here, aren't we? Because it's far easier to commiserate with someone than it is to hear of someone's great success and some wonderful thing that's happened and then to frankly and honestly be pleased for them. Isn't that so? It finds us out, our wicked hearts. We can more easily sit down with someone and hold their hand 
and say, oh, I'm so sorry for what's happened and uh, I'll pray for you than if they were a parent with unconverted children and someone comes in and says, the Lord has saved my son, wonderfully converted. And then, haven't saved mine yet. And then the challenge to rejoice. You see? It's far easier to commiserate than to rejoice. Or a minister comes to a fellow minister. You know what? Last Sabbath, the Lord saved three people in the congregation. And there actually are real conversions. There's no question about it. The Lord really visited us. I wasn't aware that I was preaching any other way, any different sermon, but the Holy Spirit came. And these three trophies of grace. And of course, we're really encouraged as a church through this now. And moreover, there have been other things which I won't go into. And then this minister who's seen no conversions for years and has a very tiny church wants to rejoice but can't help reflecting upon his own apparent fruitlessness, apparently. And that minister, quite frankly, would have found it much easier to commiserate with that other minister. No conversions, nothing happening, just like me. We'll pray for one another. But when this great triumph, well, it shouldn't have been put in triumphalist terms, but it's hard to suppress the joy, isn't it, when something like this happens. But then this other minister thinks, well, why, why should his ministry have been blessed? Why aren't my, my ser sermons being uh, blessed with conversions? What, what might be wrong with, why should it be him? And then the devil comes. And then there's that. Temptation to envy, jealousy, and the worst begins to rise. And if it's not mortified by God's grace, and if that other minister is not brought to a better and a right mind to rejoice with them that do rejoice, it can be the beginning of a foolish foolish course of envy, jealousy, resentment, even, even bitterness. And the great test, I say, is not so much commiserating with those who are sorrowing. The great test is honestly, wholeheartedly rejoicing with them that are full of joy over some great blessing some great prosperous thing that the Lord has done. And here you see Saul, sadly because he's got no grace in him, doesn't mortify this rising envy and resentment, and it just gets worse and worse. Now let's contrast this with another Saul who became Paul the Apostle. Last Wednesday we were looking at something in the book of Acts, chapter 11. It's worth just highlighting this as a pleasing contrast. Acts 11 from verse 24. Barnabas, this good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and blessing had come to a church at Antioch. And Barnabas went to Tarsus to seek Saul, found him, brought him to Antioch, and they stayed a whole year and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. But the point made last Wednesday evening was that although this was an excellent move, for Barnabas to bring Saul, now Paul, to help in the ministry at Antioch, whose gifts were emerging and who it was clear was going to be the one who would be the leader, Barnabas, in doing this, secured the beginning of his own eclipse. Because Saul, Paul, rises in prominence after this. Barnabas fades from the scene. 
But we don't read that Barnabas has a problem with that. Because what really means more to him than his prominence is the work of the Lord. And that the Lord should be glorified. And blessing should be in this church at Antioch. He could sink his own name and reputation and his own feelings under the great thing that mattered more than anything else. The furtherance of the gospel. The glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Barnabas could truly rejoice in the blessing that Saul, Paul now took forward in preference to Barnabas. Incidentally, it's thought that maybe John Mark, Barnabas' nephew, whom they took on the first missionary journey with them, he deserted halfway through. And it's thought that one reason why John Mark deserted was because he was resenting his uncle being eclipsed by Paul, and uh, Paul growing greater and greater, and Barnabas' uncle getting lesser and lesser. But never mind. Barnabas is not caring about that. But sadly, this foolish pride, Saul getting so bitter. People full of themselves cannot bear to hear anyone praised but themselves. Vavasor Powell, one of the Puritans, put it like this, "'Tis very hard to behold our own gifts without pride and the gifts of others without envy." And if we did know it, did but know it, the root cause of all family problems Church troubles is pride. Proverbs 13, verse 10. Only by pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. Tr trace every conflict and every falling out and every division and every trouble, whether in family or church, between friends, church members, whatever, trace it back and you'll find human pride, envy, jealousy at the root of it. And that's why wisdom and the meekness of wisdom oils the wheels of fellowship, friendships, relationships. Sadly, Saul here now this is going to be the issue between him and David. And he didn't do anything. Didn't do anything to deal with it. Of course, because he's graceless. Hebrews 12 and verse 15. What a warning to us this is, dear friends. In every realm. Hebrews 12 and verse 15. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And thereby many be defiled. Do you see? It's the poisonous plant that's taken root. It's bitter, poisonous. If it's allowed to spring up, it causes the one who's envying and being jealous trouble. And it defiles many around. And the only thing to do is root it out. Root and branch. Get rid of it before it does more harm. Now Saul can only see David as his deadly rival. And in the verses that follow, he even tries to throw a spear at David and kill him. And he tried to do that more than once. And then Saul and his army pursues David and his loyal followers to try to kill him and fight against God who wants to bring and will bring David to the throne. Proverbs 14 and verse 30. Envy the rottenness of the bones. It is such a terrible thing. Causes sleepless nights. Changes people. Even affects their health. How much better, I say, to be like David in this wisdom 
godly wisdom. To avoid the unwisdom of these women making their comparisons. And certainly the foolishness of allowing oneself to be affected by the blessing and success of others. Let's end with those precious words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2 and verse 3 or verse 2 Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded having the same love being of one accord of one mind let nothing be done through strife for vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. If that principle, which is wisdom, if that principle were adhered to by grace, things would be sweet and united and so blessed. I'm not saying these things because I see the absence of them here. Far from it. I'm speaking generally, but it's a reminder to us, isn't it? Here and more widely. So may the Lord bless his word. Keep our hearts. And may our blessed Saviour himself be ever our true example. Amen. <laughs>